Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us for this first of the Genomics England Research Seminar Series for this year. Um, we've got uh, a really exciting uh, program for today and for future meetings. So if we could just advance one slide. Today, we've got two talks. Uh, first, uh, from Dr. Ben Kinnisley, which I'll introduce a bit more later about colorectal cancer. And uh, the second from Dr. Gavin Arno, uh, about interrogation of the 100,000 genomes cohort for eye diseases. So uh, something for everybody, both red as heritable diseases and uh, cancers. And uh, so um, I uh, hope that you walk away from this with lots of excitement from uh, the research show. Next slide, please. The next seminar, so these seminars are held on the last Tuesday of every month at this time. Uh, so if you could put those in your diary going forward. The next one is uh, we've got, again, two presentations. The first on uh, mitochondrial DNA sequence uh, found in the nucleus uh, from Dr. Weiwei. This was, uh, paper was actually published in Nature at the end of last year and promises to be a really exciting one. And the second one is from Dr. William Macken uh, talking about um, different approaches uh, using multidisciplinary teams to maximize rare disease diagnosis from whole genome sequencing. So I hope you join us for that one too. And then my last slide before I uh, pass back over to uh, Ben to, to present is just to ask for people who are early career researchers to submit abstracts uh, for a special seminar that we're running on the 30th of May for early career researchers. So what I mean by early career researchers, it means that uh, you must be either a current MSc or a PhD student or have completed one within the last five years. And of course, we're keen particularly to get abstracts related to research that involve partnerships with uh, Genomics England. So if you could uh, send your submission to the email address that's there, so it's gsip help at genomicsengland.co.uk. Um, if you could get them to us by Friday the 3rd of March, that would be fantastic. So just to reiterate, uh, gsip-health at genomicsengland.co.uk. All right, so uh, then um, if we can um, move over to showing Ben. Uh, so Ben's uh, talk title is Whole Genome Sequencing of 2023 Colorectal Cancers reveals mutational landscapes, new driver genes, and immune reactions. So Ben is uh, a fellow who's uh, studied originally at Cambridge, but come good and came to London uh, and did his PhD at the Institute of Cancer Research with uh, Professor Richard Hulston. Um, <clears throat> and uh, he carried on then working at ICR, working particularly on GWAS and somatic uh, tumor sequencing data. Uh, working with genomics in 100,000 genomes data sets, particularly the glioma and colorectal cancer sets. Last year, uh, he began working as a senior computational biologist in the glioblastoma research group at UCL um, Cancer Institute. But today he's going to talk with us about colorectal cancer. Ben, thank you very much for uh, joining us and I'll hand over to you to present from here. Just to ask people, if you could put questions in the chat, that would be great. There will be an opportunity to ask questions directly, but I prefer if we could do them uh, from the chat because that's just easier for us to operationally manage. Over to you, Ben. Thank you, Matt. Thanks very much for the introduction and the opportunity to talk. Um, so Matt's given the overview of the talk, and this is very much on behalf of the colorectal cancer GSIP because as you will see, uh, this is this it's the end result of a very big team science-based project with lots and lots of different groups and people. Um, so I'm going to try and give appropriate acknowledgement to all the bits of work as we go through. Uh, and, and the head of the colorectal cancer GSIP is Professor Ian Tomlinson. So just here is contact details uh, if you have more, if you want to know more about the GSIP. Okay. Uh, so I'll quickly give an introduction to colorectal cancer and then uh, an overview of the colorectal cancer GSIP and all of the different players within it, uh, and then go over some of the key findings from our uh, CRC landscape project. So worldwide, uh, colorectal cancer is the second most lethal cancer as well as the third most common um, and the location of colorectal tumors across the colorectum um, can affect the 
the progression of the disease, uh, as well as its treatment and uh, patient prognosis. Uh, it's commonly grouped uh, by mutational criteria. Um, so sort of listed down here, those that have microsatellite instability or MSI uh, through <clears throat> um, deficiencies in the mismatch repair machinery, uh, as well as uh, defect active polymerase proofreading, uh, the pole tumors, which have mutations in polyexonuclease domain. Um, these are generally more hypermutated tumors. Uh, and then the other largest subset is those that are microsatellite stable or MSS, uh, which often exhibit chromosome instability. Um, and then before Genomics England, uh, there have obviously been lots of studies on colorectal cancer, but the in terms of whole genomes, the, the number of tumors has been so far relatively small. Uh, so this very large cohort, um, we have the opportunity to analyze uh, through Genomics England could potentially afford the opportunity to investigate uh, uh, and discover potential new insights into colorectal cancer. Um, so just a very quick overview of the kind of uh, tumor normal sequencing process. Um, both the tumor and the match normal were sequenced uh, for whole genome sequencing. And um, in Genomics England, it, uh, the read depths for the tumor are approximately 100x and uh, normal uh, 30x. Uh, and we made the decision to only study those from the fresh frozen, uh, which were the majority of the collateral cancer tumors anyway, but not excluding FFP, which can be enriched for artifacts. Um, as well as those which were uh, prepared using a PCR-free uh, preparation. So from the uh, sequenced uh, tumor and normal reads, uh, there are lots of different uh, types of DNA sequence alterations that you can uh, find. Uh, so firstly, um, sort of direct alterations in the DNA sequence, so simple point mutations and insertions and deletions in that else, um, as well as potentially mitochondrial mutations, and then much larger uh, changes, which are the, have been grouped here into these structural variations, which would be large um, copy number alterations, uh, structural inversions, deletions, duplications, and translocations, uh, as well as things like more complex rearrangements and extra chromosome DNA. Uh, as well as even things like uh, being able to study telomere, telomere length. Um, so there's actually a huge number of features that you could potentially extract from analyzing these uh, tumor genomes. Um, and then suggested key insights are, of course, um, potential identification of new driver events and mutations, as well as increased understanding to how the tumor evolves, uh, the mutational processes that, that might operate in, in different tumor types, um, as well as whether it might hopefully uh, alter the way uh, the, the cancers can be treated. Um, so I'm going to plug this a few times, uh, but this is the method of the AAS study write-up, which has been uh, submitted and published as a preprint. Um, I really urge people to to have a read of this because uh, I'm gonna, you know, in twenty minutes there's only so much we can say, and um, so I'm going to refer back to it quite. A lot. Um, we're very pleased that it finally got published. Um, so as part of the colorectal cancer GSIP and as part of this land study, there are a lot of different groups and. Uh, people doing various bits of the analysis. Uh, so an important, one of the major important parts is the sort of pre-processing and the quality control. Um, so we won't go into this too much in the main part of the talk, um, but just to highlight that the, the, the people involved at this very early stage, it, it was critical because it, it reflected an extensive amount of work. And then other aspects of the analysis include things like calling copy number, uh, structural variants, um, identifying driver mutations, investigating prior treatment, mutational signatures, pathways, the immune landscape, mitochondria, metastases, uh, survival, the microbiome, uh, clinical actionability, 
uh, telomere, extra chromosomal DNA. So there's a lot of different aspects. Um, but I'm only going to go into a, a, a few of, of these. Um, so as I mentioned, there was extensive quality control that was undertaken by the, the people, in, uh, as previously mentioned, uh, and, and we took it from the V8 release, which is like quite a long time ago, uh, but we had to do a data freeze at some point. And so in, in total, uh, we came to 2023 colorectal cancer tumors, and these came from uh, 2017 patients. Um, so these have been uh, roughly grouped for various aspects of the analysis uh, into different cohorts. Um, so the primary tumors, uh, primary MSS, MSI, and, and pole tumors that reflect the different mutational groups I mentioned earlier, as well as those that are metastatic, uh, and, and the majority of those were microsatellite stable. Um, and, and for for most of the analyses, it's the bits on the the left, uh, the the all column. Uh, but there was additional copy number QC that was undertaken, and and a, and a subset of samples didn't pass that. So for for some of the analyses, that would be based on a slightly smaller uh, subset. Um, so firstly, looking at the simple SMV and Indel mutations, um, a lot of the mutational signature analysis was carried out by Andreas Gruber. Um, so if we look initially at the tumor mutational burden um, of the different uh, cancer tumors, uh, they're, they're all grouped from left to right. Um, there's a clear difference in the burden between the microsatellite stable, as well as those that MSI and uh, poll. Um, with, with the MSI and pole being much uh, having a much higher number of mutations. Um, so taking these uh, mutations and grouping them initially into those uh, single base sub substitutions, uh, you can uh, derive uh, mutational signatures, uh, which, which is what I've just did uh, using the SIG profiler system. Um, and then match these back to uh, reference sets. Uh, so, so the one we used was the, which is widely used as that of Cosmic. Um, and this can start to give an idea of the different um, signatures and, and how they reflect different potential mutational processes and how they vary across different tumors, uh, but both in different cancer types and within the same cancer types. Um, and so uh, this was initially done for the SBS. Uh, as well as for uh, double base substitutions as and insertion and deletions. Um, and what's perhaps uh, most striking is, of course, you see a very big difference uh, in the proportions and number of signatures that come up in the different MSS, MSI, and poll groupings. Uh, so in MSS, you get the AID APOBEC signatures, as well as SPS 18 for reactive oxidation species damage, um, as well as currently unknown signatures, SPS 8 and SPS 93. And also interestingly, uh, SPS 88, um, which has been associated with uh, exposure to coal plankton, uh, which is produced by PKS uh, bacteria. Um, and then MSI, unsurprisingly, uh, highly enriched for the SBS44 MMR deficiency signature and poll for the poly deficiency signature, as well as SBS28, uh, which is currently unknown. So following on from this, we uh, wanted to start looking for driver mutations and if we could identify any novel driver genes. Um, and so for this, we use the Intigen um, software uh, and annotated mutations using OncoKB. Um, and so on, on the left is a, is a plot sorted by the, from top to bottom by the, the number of tu tumors that contains a uh, oncogenic mutation in the identified driver genes. And, and, and as you can see, uh, once you get past the very um, highly mutated known uh, established CRC drivers like APC and P53 and KRAS, um, you very quickly see a tail of very low frequency driver events. It doesn't mean that they're not important in, in driving that particular cancer, um, but the tail really is quite striking. 
Um, and so we identified 185 driver genes in total. And this included 68 that were already known to be important in colorectal cancer, as well as 51 that had been um, shown to be important events in other cancer types, and, and, and also 66 potentially novel driver candidates. Um, and there's a big difference uh, in, in frequency of drivers, both the, in, in known drivers, and so MSS have much higher frequencies relative to the other uh, subtypes of APC, P53, and KRAS mutations, whereas the MSI and poll tumors uh, were enriched for PIK3, CA, as well as P10 mutations. Um, and some of the more uh, sort of interesting, promising driver candidates, but uh, which still needs uh, a lot of investigation on, on how they might um, be important in colorectal cancer progression uh, include RAS GFL1, which is involved in the RAS cyclone pathway, RGS12 in the MAC kinase pathway, uh, as well as uh, HGY2, which is a histone. Um, so perhaps unsurprisingly, given the, the big difference in the mutational burden in general between the different cohorts, uh, there was a striking difference in the per tumor mutation count of uh, oncogenic driver events between uh, what the, the microsatellite stable, the non-hypermutant, as well as between the MSI and the pole uh, groups, which had a, a far higher number of per tumor driver events. And something that's helping us to understand more about not only the, the role of established drivers, as well as where the, the newly implicated drivers might fit in is to start um, trying to put them into different pathways that are known to be important already in, in, in colorectal cancer, as well as other cancers. So the, the wind signaling pathways, as well as the MAC kinase pathways shown here. We also um, carried out uh, analysis of uh, non-coding elements uh, using the software OncoDrive FML. Uh, this was restricted to the primary MSS subset uh, according to a number of different uh, elements uh, defined by Ensemble. Um, for example, like promoters, transcription factor binding sites, link RNAs, untranslated regions. Uh, and so, but what I wanted to quickly highlight was uh, in G, the non canonical splice regions. So these are not the established splice mutations, but ones that extend further into the intron. And there was a very strong signal in, in APC. And um, this was driven by uh, this. Uh, C.835-A8A to G mutation, uh, which was mutated in um, 110, 7% of the primary MSS tumors. Um, and this was actually highly uh, mutually exclusive with uh, tumors in which there was uh, by allelic inactivation of APC, so either through a, a, a oncogenic mutation in APC or um, de it deletion of the gene through a copy number change. Um, and it's also been previously shown through another study that um, tumors with this uh, mutation have high beta cadena expression. So I'll quickly go through some analysis that Alex Cornish carried out on uh, identification of recurrent SV host hotspots. Um, so again, as with a lot of these analyses, this is just one slide that represented a huge amount of work. Um, so Alex developed an SV cooling consensus cooling pipeline. Um, and then from this list of uh, cons consensus SVs, classified them according to whether they were more complex. So we're sort of overlapping and interlinked in, in some way. Um, so um, the largest example of which is in chromothripsis, as well as those that were complex but couldn't be uh, classified. Uh, so these are shown on the left panel. And then uh, as well as those that are so-called uh, simple SVs that aren't, aren't complex. Uh, and, and in these, he did um, 
an analysis to see whether we could find recurrent uh, simple SV hotspots uh, across the, the genome that could indicate uh, an important uh, activation of an oncogene or um, inactivation of a tumor suppressor. Um, so we uh, identified 87 of these across the uh, primary MSS tumors. Uh, examples of, the, of those that are novel include those at ACVR2A, uh, SMAD2, uh, and, and there were some interesting potential candidates which need to be investigated more, uh, especially, for example, one at 17Q24.3, which is a, a candidate cis-regulatory element for uh, SOX9, which is known to be important in colorectal cancer. Um, so, uh, perhaps, uh, similarly to this, uh, the copy, a large amount of copy number uh, calling was uh, carried out in order to identify uh, potential recurrent copy number alterations in, in CRC and whether there are any novel ones. Uh, so the majority of this work was carried out by Anna Frangu, um, who used Battenberg to obtain copy number profiles. And then we then took the, um, the, the copy number calls from this logistic to identify any recurrent uh, focal uh, amplifications or deletions. Um, and, and so known for the MSS tumors on the left and then MSI uh, on the right. Uh, but the most uh, interesting ones are for MSS. Uh, and there are potentially novel uh, regions that are identified, including those uh, deletions of PRK3R1, um, as well as amplifications of uh, NED9, which have been shown to be uh, important driver events in colorectal cancer uh, through mutation analysis. Um, so quickly summarizing some of the work that Esther Lakatos uh, carried out on looking at the immune landscape in colorectal cancer. Uh, so this is uh, predict predicting new antigens as well as potential immune escape mechanisms. Um, so the distribution of each tumor uh, is shown uh, on this on the top plot um, by the the tumor subgroup that they're in, poll MSI or MSS. Um, as well as then whether um, they have a potential immune escape mechanism. Uh, and so th this could include a mutation or a loss of heterozygosity in an antigen presenting gene, uh, as well as in um, an HLA gene, um, which could also show potential allelic imbalance. And, and these could be ways that the different tumors have to try and evade uh, the immune system and therefore um, contribute to their increased uh, sort of survival of the tumor. Um, and uh, perhaps unsurprisingly, the uh, hypermutated tumor, so on the bottom right, uh, is, shows the distribution of the immune escape mechanisms by the different uh, tumor subtypes, uh, and they had a far higher proportion of the tumors that had at least one of the potential different immune escape mechanisms compared to the microsatellite stable tumors, which have a lower mutational burden. Um, and also, uh, perhaps quite interesting was that um, a number of uh, genes have identified in the driver analysis were also important uh, potential uh, immune-related uh, genes. So these have been a number of these have been plotted in this pathway diagram to just show that in general that th these are much more enriched for the sort of hypermutated cohorts, the MSIs and the poles, than the microsatellite stable. Um, so next I'll talk a little about uh, work that was again carried out by Alex Cornish on um, looking at mutations induced by prior therapy. Um, so he found that uh, radiotherapy of the colorectum of, of the tumor uh, was associated with um, higher activity of the indel signature ID8. Um, so there's, so the, um, as you can see in the graph on the on the left, the the tumors with uh, known to be treated with radiotherapy uh, had a much higher proportion than 
well then and those that didn't which is basically zero um and then this was uh there was a relationship with the duration of radiotherapy uh, as well as the time time since the first radiotherapy uh, which substantiated these uh, interesting associations. Um, and in addition, uh, he found a significant association between uh, neoadjuvant treatment of oxaloplatin, so that's a platinum-based chemotherapy uh, with higher activity of the uh, DBS signature, DBS5. Uh, and, and in a similar way, uh, there was a um, relationship between the duration of oxaloplatin treatment and, and the, the number of uh, detected uh, mutations attributed to that signature. Um, again, uh, as you probably see that uh, Alex contributed a, a lot of work to this uh, paper and he also did uh, a lot of work uh, correlating uh, the genomic features to um, clinical um, I information and, and so one of the most interesting or uh, potentially valuable uh, clinical features is, is the mentioned before the tumor site so the location from more proximal to more distal colon um, so he groups uh, he grouped the different features by those um, anatomical locations to look if there was a relationship so firstly um, with the um, mutational signatures uh, as you go from left to right you see a reduction in uh, activity of SBS5 as well as SBS18 and SBS1 uh, but an increase in SBS8 uh, but quite striking decreases in ID1 and ID2 and an increase in the signature ID18 um, and similarly there are relationships with uh, number of SMVs and indels and structural variants, uh, as, as well as um, identified uh, recurrent copy number arm changes, um, so lo loss of 18P and 18Q is um, generally associated um, with the, uh, more tumours uh, as you go more distally across the tumour, um, as well as um, with driver mutations on the sort of middle lower panel. So you get an increase in P53 mutations generally as you go more distally, uh, but a decrease in KRAS. So I've tried to give a brief overview of this um, study, which we believe is the largest ever study of colorectal cancer genomes. Um, Significantly, we have identified 66 novel driver genes, uh, and, and the challenge now is to in investigate exactly how they might be contributing to colorectal cancer progression uh, and their biology. Um, and we've tried to uh, highlight the importance of considering the, the, the tumor site, which is potential strength of this data, just in terms of the, the number of tumors and the, the, the clinical data that's been available to, to correlate with all of these genomic features identified. Um, and as with many things, there are lots of ongoing challenges. Um, so we've, um, a, a lot of the groups have contributed a huge amount of analysis and, and lots of different types of data that you can get from uh, these whole genomes and the challenge really is to to integrate this into something where you can get a, a really meaningful narrative on how this changes how we view uh, collateral cancer um, and as part of that that will probably require further exploration of the non-coding genome which is, is still um, remains very intriguing but slightly elusive um, and again, I'm going to plug our paper, so please uh, have a read of um, the paper and hopefully that, I mean, that, that contains all of the detailed methods that everybody has produced for all, all of the work that's carried out. Um, so please have a read of that. Um, and that just leaves me with the huge list of acknowledgements of all of the different people uh, involved in this project. Um, and of, of course, people at Genomics England and um, most importantly, the, 
the, the, the, the participants who um, consented for their data to be uh, analyzed because without without that we wouldn't be able to do this study um, so thank you very much um, and welcome any questions okay Ben thank you very much for that um, so questions in the chat box if we could please I'm just going to kick off and just ask uh, so um, ancestral diversity something of considerable interest even in uh, both germline and somatic mutations in cancers um, did you have a look at that with regard to colorectal cancer uh, sorry, can you repeat the first part? Did you have a look at ancestral diversity and variation in, uh, for example, uh, somatic mutation profiles between different people of different ancestral backgrounds? Um, that is a very good question. That That is not something we considered for this uh, study, but I, I agree it's, um, it, it's, it's very valuable to consider in the future. Yeah, okay. Um, all right, so cool. I'll go over to uh, Anonymous, who asked a question about the bioinformatics tools that were used for neoantigen prediction and immune escape prediction. It's a technical question. Hi, Ben, I've lost you. Okay. I think we've lost Ben somehow. Um, we might have to actually at this point move on to uh, Gavin, our next speaker, uh, because I don't think we can carry on asking questions if we don't have a speaker to answer them. Um, so in which case uh, we'll uh, pass on those questions. So uh, if Ben gets a chance to answer those in the chat, uh, that'd be great. Uh, thank you very much, Ben, for your um, excellent presentation. I had a whole stack of questions I could ask, which I'm going to send by email. Okay, um, so the next presentation I'm going to move to is uh, Gavin Arna. Uh, so uh, Gavin uh, did his PhD at St George's University um, and went on to become director of the Sonali Laboratory for Marfan Syndrome um, investigation or studies at St George's. And 2012, he moved to the UCL Institute of Ophthalmology to work with uh, professors uh, Tony Moore and Andrew Webster. And he's going to present to us today uh, on interrogation of 100,000 genomes project for eye disease cohort, uh, eye disease cohort for novel genes. Um, thank you very much, Gavin, for presenting. Over to you again, questions in the chat and uh, we'll, uh, and, and rather than, uh, over the uh, directly by audio over to you Gavin thank you uh can you see my screen okay yes we can it's fine okay. and I can hear you wonderful thank you very much um thanks for the invitation to talk today I, I did one of these uh a few years ago when it was in person in Charterhouse Square so it's a pleasure to be back to update what we've been doing um, so yeah, so I'm based at the Institute of Ophthalmology. It's now my uh, my own research lab doing doing this work, um, funded the past five years by Fight for Sight. So we're going to talk a bit about what we've been finding in the hundred thousand genomes rare disease cohort, and focusing specifically on the on the ophthalmology subset of patients. So so this is where we are now this is the the paper that was published um last year in the new england journal of medicine and you can see that the the overall diagnostic yield for the project is is roughly 25 percent and that's increased um the more family data we have so so singleton's um solve rate is very low but uh when we when we get to trios we can we can get a better solve rate from the, the rare disease patients um, and that's increased again if we're if we're really sure that it's a proper Mendelian genetic disease that they have. So if we focus on those families specifically, we can push that diagnostic yield a bit higher. And then the panel below, which breaks down the, the cohort by disease group, um, we can see that ophthalm, ophthalmology does very well. So I think we're probably the highest diagnostic yield, if not one of the highest for the ophthalmology cohort. And that, I think, um, 
is is due to a lot of factors. We've, we've done a lot of hard work solving many of these patients, specifically from, from Moorfields Eye Hospital, but also we have a very good understanding of the genetics of rare inherited eye diseases, partly due to the fact that, that clinical investigations are very, very specific, very sensitive. We can see the affected cells in a live patient. We can test those cells functionally in a live patient. And the patients are very, very good at being able to tell us exactly what their disease is, which is, which is very different to many other organ systems of the body. So for a researcher like me, a molecular geneticist, the, the retina and inherited eye diseases are a, you know, a remarkable piece of tissue and a remarkable disease area to, to be able to study. But many families remain undiagnosed, and, and we think there are several reasons that contribute to this. So we, we're certain that there are new genes to be discovered, and we're, we're discovering new genes all the time, not just, not just in my lab, but across the world. Um, and we're getting more familiar with some of these new uh, phenomena that are appearing. So hypomorphic alleles, where, where mild variants in, in genes that we thought we understood previously are accounting for a proportion of patients who previously would have come back with a VUS or, or, or with a, an unsolved uh, a, a negative genetic report. And similarly, novel genotypes and phenotypes associations, so syndromic disease genes um, are appearing in our retinal disease panel now, so genes that were thought to cause severe neurodevelopmental disorders, we see them now in, in mild and late onset retinal dystrophy cases. So these are, these are new associations and, and different to what we've just described in hypomorphic alleles as well. We're becoming more familiar with non-exonic variants. So Ben mentioned uh, uh, previously, you know, minus eight changes, similar to what he's seen in his studies, we, we can see deep intronic variants that affect splicing, regulatory region variants, um, enhancers and promoter region variants that, that cause disease in a Mendelian way as well. And we're becoming more familiar and becoming more used to being able to interpret these as well as we learn from projects like the 100,000 Genomes Project. Similarly, structural variants, which were previously very hard to, to identify, whole genome sequencing gives us the the ideal platform to be able to pick those up and characterize those as well. And then some other um, uh, more exotic uh, 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 types of uh, genetic explanations or non-genetic explanations as to why patients remain unsolved. And so we're interested in identifying these cases, characterizing them and, uh, and demonstrating how these genes or these variants are causing disease and ultimately feeding this back to patients and families via the uh, via the, the, the clinical genetics laboratory hubs. And so in my lab, we're doing this in, in a few different ways. We're looking at uh, a phenotype driven analysis, and, and this is based on our multidisciplinary team. So clinicians, geneticists like me, clinical scientists, genetic counsellors, we all get together and we meet and we discuss each individual patient who's been recruited via Moorfields to the 100,000 Genomes Project. And that's over a thousand patients and families that we've, that we've recruited over the years. And so we talk about the phenotypes, the presentation, the family history, and, and what sort of genes that those fit in. So remember, we mentioned that that the uh, phenotyping and the, the clinical data is very specific and very detailed. So we can, we can leverage that to lead our genetic investigations and to point us towards the right gene. And also in cases where we suspect they have a recessive disease, we found one hit in the gene and we're, we're missing a second hit. We can look very, very deeply at that gene and, and find second hits um, in the genome data. And that includes things like non-coding variant analysis, um, regulatory regions, cryptic splice altering variants and, and things like that, and functionally testing those in the lab, looking at structural variants in different ways, using different algorithms and tools and, and even different sequence methodologies, characterizing novel genes, 
and also looking at the possibility of genes that have been missed by whole genome sequencing, so intractable regions of the genome. I'm not going to talk in any detail about those today, then. So I'll start with non-coding variants. So this, this is a paper that we published um, uh, last year now, uh, in the summer, um, where we, we took a series of patients who were negative Sorry, that's, I'm just going to close the window. So we took a, a, a panel of a cohort of patients who were negative following the um, clinical pipeline of the, the 100,000 Genomes Project. And we looked at them with the multidisciplinary team and uh, selected cases where we, we thought we had a good idea of which gene would be causative in those patients. Um, and we did this um, uh, on, so this is one particular example from that paper. This is a patient, a female proband who developed uh, a cone rod dystrophy um, where cones are affected, the central macula is affected first, followed by rod degeneration later. So a central um, vision uh, impairment first. Um, and we found that she carried this single uh, heterozygous stop gain in, in a gene called uh, BBS10, which was in keeping with her retinal dystrophy. It also causes Bardet Beadle syndrome, but it also is a known cause of non syndromic retinopathy as well. And it was thought that this was, uh, this was a good candidate, it was a good fit for her phenotype. And so we looked again at that gene. It's a very small gene, there's only two exons. Um, and we found that upstream of that, of that uh, gene on the trans allele, there was this uh, minus 80 duplication of a single nucleotide. So this was our candidate variant in this individual. Now, um, we, we, looked at, uh, we looked at what that might be doing to the gene, whether it fell in transcription factor binding regions, enhancer binding regions in the promoter and so on. And that gave us a bit more evidence to follow that up in more detail. So we cloned the region into a luciferase reported gene and assayed the effect of that variant and the effect of lots of different variants around that region. And, and we found that indeed, if you introduce that variant into, into a fragment, then, uh, then you knock out transcription of that gene, essentially. So this is how we identified the second mutation in a single individual from the genomic sequencing project. And so we've done that in lots of cases now, and here's kind of a summary of, uh, of a group of different variants that we've identified in using this method. So we found lots of intronic variants that we've demonstrated to affect splicing in some way. We found uh, a bunch more upstream variants that are affecting either transcription factor binding sites, promoters, or enhancers in some way. And we think that this type of variant probably accounts for uh, greater than 10% of the unsolved cohort in our hands, at least. So moving on a little bit then. So we're interested in retinal dystrophies and uh, uh, many of the genes are only expressed in the retina. And this is a difficult situation if we're, if we're keen on testing the functional effect of a splice site or a deep intronic mutation that we think affects splicing. We can't really go back to the patient, get an RNA sample, do an RT-PCR, and then sequence the transcript from that, from that patient because the genes simply aren't expressed in blood. So traditionally, the methods that would be used for this would be uh, mm -hmm. things like mini gene assays, where we create an artificial um, chunk of a gene with, with introns and exons, and we clone in our intron of interest and, and our mutation of interest um, and see what effect that has, or culturing cells uh, into, into uh, pluripotent stem cells and then developing those into retinas. But these are, these are expensive, these are complex, they take a long time, and they're not really suitable for a clinical lab to take on board. So we need a, a new method that will help interpret this type of variant in a, in a cheap, quick and easy way. And we think we've kind of found that answer. So nanopore sequencing is a bit different to typical RT-PCR and Sanger sequencing in that 
the uh, individual molecules of PCR amplicon in a tube contribute a read to uh, a, 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 an IGV plot, whereas with typical Sanger sequencing, each molecule contributes to an accumulation of signal in that in that readout. So it works in a different way. And we can we can leverage this. And this is an example of a, a gene that's only expressed in the retina. This is the top one gene. And you can see the uh, the readout from um, from uh, uh, expression data here. It's restricted to the retina. And there's this variant that was that was actually published in the original discovery paper for the gene back in 1998. And it's this minus six variant um, that the authors of that paper said, well, we think this is we think this is a pathogenic mutation, but we can't prove it because we can't detect the RNA in blood. And that was as far as they got. So we can look again at this variant. There are a few patients in the Genomics England study who, who have this variant, who have a retinal dystrophy. So we strongly believe that it's pathogenic. And the splice AI predictions kind of support that, support that assertion as well. But this is what happens when we RT-PCR across that gene. We get a blank gel. So we can't see anything and we can't sang a sequence a blank gel. So we can, however, sequence that blank gel using nanopore sequencing. And this is what we see from exactly this, a blank gel. We can see this uh, huge number of reads generated. This is reads measured in the hundreds, if not the thousands from an empty uh, agarose gel um, sample. And we can see that indeed that variant is leading to the uh, truncation of exon 15. So we're using the, the, the transcription machinery is using an, uh, an alternative splice site within exon 15 here. This AG position here is recognized as a, as a splice site. And this leads to a frame shift. And that's how that variant is causing disease. So we can leverage nanopore sequencing technology to be able to characterize variants that we otherwise would have not been able to detect in patient blood samples. And this has wide applicability. We can look at cryptic splicing. We can look at low-level transcript alterations, so variants that affect a very low proportion of a transcript. We can look at non-expressed genes like TOLP1. We can phase single nucleotide variants, and we can use this to characterize regulatory region variants as well. And so this is unpublished. We've got a, a manuscript in process to describe some of these things. And so moving on to, to novel gene disease associations then. So uh, one, one pathway that's affected by, uh, or, or uh, where variants lead to disease is the coenzyme Q10 biosynthesis pathway. And this is mitochondrial disease. It causes respiratory uh, chain uh, dysfunction um, and uh, leads to seizures, ataxia, encephalopathy, cardiomyopathy, and renal failure. And it's fairly well reported. There's lots of papers over the years reporting this. So occasionally in those individuals, a retinopathy has been reported, but very occasionally. And eight genes in the coenzyme Q10 pathway have, always, have been implicated in this disorder. So another paper that we published uh, in 2022 of our work reports that coenzyme Q10 biosynthesis genes can also cause um, retinopathy and, and non-syndromic retinopathy at that. And so this is uh, a little summary of the findings from that paper. So we've got the clinical phenotypes on, on one side, all these patients exhibit uh, fairly typical retinitis pigmentosa, fairly mild, but fairly typical RP. Um, and these are the families that we report and genes in uh, four different, uh, uh, sorry, mutations in four different genes in the pathway have been associated with this. And so I'm going to focus on uh, a couple of these mutations now. So one is this minus 25 variant in the PDSS1 gene. So this was predicted to, to lead to uh, misplicing um, based on this acceptor loss and probably because of a branch point, um, according to Splice AI. Traditional tools predicted no effect of this, of this variant on, on splicing. 
And this is where the variant is. There's this uh, exon here, and you can see that these alternate transcripts have uh, have a, a different start site, and actually this occurs in the UTR of those alternate transcripts. And so again, we're able to use nanopore sequencing to characterize what's going on with this variant. This is from a, a blood sample from, from the uh, patient who carried this mutation. And when we run it out on a gel, we can see if we compare the, uh, the, the patient band, this one in the middle here, compared to the control, we do get the same two bands. It's just that the intensity is a little bit different. So the wild type band is this bright one at the bottom, and there's this alternate spliced uh, transcript just above it here in the control. So the same two bands in our patient. And when we sequence that on, on the nanopore machine, we can actually see precisely what's happening with those two bands. We can see that the alternate transcript is being used, and that's what gives us this, this bigger band across the region. Um, and we're able to, to split those reads into the two different alleles and show that although there is a very low level of this alternate transcript being, um, being uh, expressed in controls, it's increased in our affected individual. And when we split the reads out by allele, we can see that almost all of the, uh, the alternate transcript is actually coming from the mutant allele harboring this minus 25 variant. And so this is a non-coding transcript. So it's being made instead of the wild type transcript in this case. And that's how this variant is pathogenic. And so one other thing that we were able to do from that study, one other variant we found recurrently was this missense variant. It's, it's a bit common. It's, it's in uh, 411 individuals in, uh, in the NOMAD data set, and one of those is, is a homozygote. So it's been classified as, as benign or a variant of uncertain significance previously by other labs, but we found it in three families and always in trans with a loss of function variant. So that that led us to believe that this is likely to be one of these hypomorphic, mild alleles that, that, that probably in the homozygous state won't cause disease, but when, when paired with the loss of function leads to disease. And we did some uh, stats on this to, to demonstrate how it's enriched in our, in our disease group compared to, uh, compared to the NOMAD uh, uh, data set and, and, and came up with this uh, odds ratio to, to demonstrate that. And we also showed from the from the whole genome data, the 100,000 data, that this sat on a 400 KB ancestral haplotype. So it's possible that there are other variants within this haplotype to, that, that contribute to its pathogenicity. It's not the, the variant on its own that causes disease. And so then one more thing uh, before we finish, we'll talk about a, a gene discovery because that was mentioned in the title. So. Again, this is a paper from, from 2022 where we, we report the findings of this novel gene associated with retinopathy, CFAP20. And this amazing image is on, on the side here. These, these were done by our collaborators, and, and all these beautiful images basically show that when you knock this out in the zebrafish, you get a pretty severe retinopathy in the zebrafish. And so I'm going to focus on, on our discovery patient who was in genomic syndrome. So this chap um, up here, number one in family one, um, he was he was first uh, known to have night, night vision problems at the age of about 18, and, and he was in Sudan at the time. Um, he was seen a lot later for the first time at Moorfields Eye Hospital in two, 2008 when he was 51 years old, and blood was taken for genetics at that time. And that involved single gene testing by, by PCR and sequencing or uh, SNP array data to, to look at uh, regions of homozygosity. So that's what happened for him in 2010 with his two affected sisters, parents of second cousins. We did uh, homozygosity mapping to identify the autozygous regions shared between the affected individuals. And this is what we found. We found this 25 megabase segment of chromosome 16. This was the largest region shared between the three siblings. So we then had whole exome sequencing back in 2013, um, which identified two rare coding homozygous variants within that region of autozygosity, two genes, 
both cilia genes and and both with no further evidence so we kind of you know where do we go from there we've got two good candidate genes we don't know what to do with that and there it sat until 2019 when uh, the, the, uh, the, the gel data was coming back to us and we found two additional families through gel who also had a retinopathy harboring biallelic genotypes in the CFAP20 gene, so gene two in our, in our candidate list. And then just like London buses, a third one came along, uh, identified through gene matcher from a, a group in Canada. So we then had four families, all with biallelic genotypes in this gene. We did lots of functional work with our collaborators and published this in 2022 in Nature Communications. Um, so that, you know, that sums up the diagnostic odyssey that was that was brought to an end for that family by recruitment to the 100,000 Genomes Project. So a real, you know, success story for, for that family and the study for them. And so in summary, then, whole genome sequencing enables us to characterize uh, the variant landscape across the genome to a, 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 degree that, a degree that we've never been able to do before. So this is a fantastic new resource for, for researchers like me. And uh, large scale studies in inherited retinal dystrophy are a, are a rich resource for discovery. We've got lots of, of avenues of research to, to, to travel down and to discover new things. Um, new genes remain. We're still looking for new genes all the time. And uh, the, the key to being able to characterize those now is that we, we often don't have all the families in our individual centers to provide all the evidence for causality. We need to, we need to collaborate across huge platforms like this and uh, gene sharing platforms as well. And in our hands, deep phenotyping really, really helps to, to, to drill down into the, into the data to, to guide our interrogation of the variants that may be causing disease. Non-coding variants, we think are pretty important. We, we haven't talked here about this, but tools to in interrogate this kind of variance on a larger scale, the work of people like Jamie Ellingford and, and Nikki Whiffin, who are working on this sort of thing, this, this really complements the sort of work that we're doing. And, and we think that our work complements their work. So putting these, these tools together to be able to expand these analysis across the whole gene panel or indeed the whole genome are really going to push the way that these studies are done. And we think that, you know, tier, tier three variants are important. They, they shouldn't be ignored by the pipeline. They should be interrogated in negative cases. And, and hopefully that's the sort of work that can be taken on by the clinical hubs as well. And lastly, we think that, that nanopore sequencing is, is really going to emerge as a key tool for being able to characterize some of these variants that we're identifying and, and to, to look at the genome data in different ways. And I'll end there and thank all my uh, funders and, and collaborators. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Gavin. We've got a couple of minutes for some questions. I'm going to kick off by one which uh, I was thinking of as we went through and Anonymous and Andrew Douglas were also wondering, which is that it appears that you took an agarose gel slide which had no DNA in it and out of nothing, you've miraculously managed to get O and T sequence. Okay. And we're wondering how it was that you managed to get from one to the other. Yeah, that's uh, th so that happened uh, it, during during lockdown for the first time. So essentially, if you were to nano, if you were to sang a sequence, the the PCR product from uh, something like that, then. You know, the, the traditional way is you cut the band out of the gel and then you, you clean that up and you sequence out, right? So you don't need to do that with nanopore sequencing. Um, the, cleanup, the cleanup step happens after you do the sequencing when you're aligning that, that data to the genome. So you, you simply take your, your uh, PCR tube, <laughs> Um, clean that up with beads so you get rid of the contaminants from that and then you sequence everything that's in that tube and the way that the way that nanopore sequencing works differently to to agarose gel and and sanger sequencing is that you don't have to you don't have to have a signal strong enough 
on an agarose gel to be visible to be able to generate read data from nanopore sequencing. So the assumption is that your PCR has worked, it's just worked at a very low level that's not detectable on, on agarose gel, but there are PCR products within that tube that you can then sequence with nanopore sequencing. I hope, I hope that makes sense. Yeah, it sort of does, although I'm still anxious about, you know, you obviously need a fairly large amount of DNA input to be able to sequence with nanopore. Much no, more you, than... don't, you don't, because each, each individual molecule within that tube makes a read, right? So if, if you do a PCR reaction, and, and this is capitalizing on a, on a phenomenon called, called illegitimate transcription, right, Where, which is fairly well understood, or it's very well, fairly well reported, not very well understood, whereby all genes are transcribed at a very low level in all tissues. And so you have a very low copy number of your gene of interest, whether it's a retina specific gene in the blood or, or whatever, PCR amplification of that will generate enough reads that you can then sequence with nanopore sequencing, but it won't generate enough of a signal so that you can see it on an agarose gel. Okay, so it's not just that, as Chris Boll suggests, that maybe that this, the product was low in mass, so off the bottom of the gel, or, no, 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 oh, no. Sorry, no. off the top of the gel or the other way around, that it was very high no, and didn't it's, make it out of the gel, or heterogeneous in size, in which case it was a smear. So no, it's uh, so what 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 we see when we do the nanopore sequencing, we do, we see a clear um, a clear product from that from that uh, PCR reaction. So we see an individual transcript. It's not a it's not a smear. There may be multiple bands, and this is something we've seen in a few cases where there are there are different um transcripts different alternate transcripts that are produced so we get different levels of, of cryptic splicing and different um different exon exclusion or different partial intron inclusion but what we think that that does is that that those together cumulatively contribute to disease but individually each of those is a, is a fairly low signal does that make sense Yes, sort of. <laughs> I'm, I'm still not quite paper, sure I believe that. Yeah. I'll have to read it. Okay, so <laughs> look, just one, one, more, <laughs> one more question from uh, Howell Williams, uh, who congratulates you on your on your work, and then says uh, uh, you've identified quite a few intronic splice variants, and is there something about eye diseases that they're particularly susceptible to this, or is it just that you've actually focused on using splice AI? And yeah, that's a that's a nice question. I I. I'm not sure there's something specific about eye disease that means that, that they're particularly susceptible. I think, um, you know, we use eye disease as a model for, for Mendelian disease, and I think we can kind of extrapolate the things that we're finding outwards from there. I think, you know, the fact that, the fact that we've got a very, very good understanding as a community of the genetic cause of eye diseases is, means that we're able to find these and able to characterize these types of variants effectively in this group of patients, right? So if you if you compare it to the uh, to the ID cohort in in gel, for example, with a very very low solve rate and uh, you know lots of complex inheritance and and lots of complicating uh, factors making making the investigation difficult, then the eye disease group of patients is, is much easier to solve and much easier to focus on. So I think that's what the, that's why we're good at doing this. Yeah, I mean, I take it that basically eye diseases, and particularly the phenotypes that were recruited into 100,000 genomes, are much less likely to be polygenic, where I think most of the other large co where the ones where there's high miss rates, it's more likely to be polygenic. Now, look, uh, I'm, Gavin, I'm afraid we're, we're going to have to pause here because we're, we have run significantly over. Um, there are a few more questions in the chat, which are, if you had time to actually um, uh, type some responses to, I'm sure that the questioners would really appreciate that. Thank you very much, everybody in the audience for joining us and thank you for the questions. And if you, if I could invite you to put in your diaries to uh, join again at two o'clock on the 28th, Tuesday the 28th of February, I'm sure we'll have a fascinating seminar then too. Thank you so much, everybody. Bye-bye then. Thank you.